Wow, I think that's the, the best intro I've ever had. I think you just need to come with me wherever I go. That was like, I feel so encouraged. I feel blessed. So, and I think you know me better than I do. I'm like, wow. Um, wow. And talk about that testimony. Let's go. God is moving. Is the DTS stirred up, fired up? I would be after hearing that. I'm like, man, I want to join you guys on outreach. It's going to be good. Um, I am so excited to share tonight. Um, as Connor said, I did spend time in Brazil. So if I get a little bit passionate tonight, it's the Brazilian inside of me. Any Brazilians in the house? Okay. We'll see. We'll see. But it is cold in here tonight. Um, yeah, man, I, I, I'm excited for what I'm going to share about. Just a little bit about me. I mean, I, I feel like I had an intro planned, but there's nothing else to say. <laughs> He's destroyed it. <laughs> you don't need to know anything. I'm here. I love Jesus. I'm burning for what God is doing in this nation, and I'm expecting. And we've just got off the back of some tours. So I do lead Neighbors and Nations and work with The Send. And we've just been in Scotland and in Newcastle and Sheffield. Shout out to Tomek from Newcastle who's joined us tonight, um, who we met on the road. And man, God is moving in this nation. Like, God is moving in the UK. And I'm from Brighton, and I just didn't know I would grow up and see God move in this nation the way I am. And I don't know whether this, like, God's just put a faith in my heart. I know we haven't seen the fullness of it yet, but I'm just going to keep speaking it out again and again and again because God is doing something in this nation. Like, He is moving in profound ways. We were just had the privilege, we were at. Um, Sheffield for Ascend Experience Night, and um, we shared the message of the Send. And those of you that are reverso, you probably know and have experienced it. And we went out on the streets afterwards, and we did evangelism. And I'm just like, since when did it become normal in the UK that 50, 60 people hit the streets after an event and do evangelism? We literally walked down this one street, and like every Christian was just peeling off and speaking to. I don't think anyone got past a Christian that night and didn't get the gospel shared with them. And I'm like, since when did that become normal? Since when did it become normal that you mention evangelism in the church and people start cheering? Like, I experienced that in Brazil. I didn't think I'd experienced that in the UK. But it's happening. We got a testimony from Sheffield about a 15-year-old girl that came, and she got so fired up to share the gospel. It was on Saturday night, the event. We got a testimony on Monday night that on Monday, she went into her secondary school, and she was sharing the gospel with her friends at school. And she ends up meeting with her headmaster and starts sharing with her headmaster. And her headmaster gives her permission at the next whole school assembly to share what she experienced and share the gospel. I'm like, so good. For those of you at Verso, like we did a call to action at the end of the night to start a spot fire. And the spot fire is just groups of young people that come together to pray for revival and go out on the streets. And one of my friends in our team was doing follow-up calls. And they called this guy, I think he was, I don't know his age, 19, 20. Um, and he said, yeah, I was at Ascend Experience Night because two weeks before I was in the pub and some guys shared the gospel with me and I gave my life to Jesus in the pub in St. Albans. I'm like, that is happening, like, in the next city along. Anyway, he comes to the Send Experience. He gets so fired up. And my friend is sharing about spot fires. He's like, this is incredible. All I want to do is share the gospel. It's like, man, it is profound. Someone else, I just heard this testimony today from an event a while ago. We were doing kind of a second round of follow-ups. And someone that didn't kind of get followed up with the first time, answers, they answer the phone today and we're talking about spot fires and, okay, this is how you start it. And he literally interrupts them. He's like, I'm sorry, I started it three months ago. We've been meeting every week. We've been going out, sharing the gospel on the streets for three months now. I'm like, we don't even need to do the follow-up. They're just going for it. So I'm so encouraged, and off the back of that is how I come into tonight. Is anyone encouraged? Okay, whether you're here for like six months or you live here, like God is moving in this nation, and it's such a privilege to be a part of it. And last week, I wasn't here, but I got to listen to uh, Matt Nelson's word. Um, and I'm going to be talking about revival culture tonight. And I was umming and ahhing a little bit for the last week or two about like, should this be talked about or not? And then I was hearing Matt Nelson's word, and at the end, I don't know if you caught it, but he said this. He kind of released a prophetic word over Wyam Harpenden, and he said two things. He said that he feels like our community is right on the cusp of breakthrough. And then he said this, I believe there is a well of revival, and as a community, you are so close to it breaking through. And so I took that as full permission. I'm like, let's talk about a culture of revival. Let's go. <laughs> um, 
And so that's what we're going to talk about tonight. And I'm going to frame that word because if you're like me, I don't know, you can hear the word revival. On one end of the spectrum, you picture like a sovereign presence of God over a city and everyone like flat on their face and that's revival. And if you're the other end of the spectrum, you're like revival isn't a word in the Bible. It doesn't exist. We've all got the Holy Spirit. We all see personal revival. There's truth to both. But I want to frame it tonight as like, I've got a, a good definition here. I was reading this. It says this. The revival starts in the hearts of a group of believers. It transforms their lives and then spills over into gospel demonstration and activation. And so when I talk about this tonight, we're not talking about like this out there sovereign thing that happens that we have no control over. Like simply, we're talking about revival in the context. Like, man, what would it look like if a group of believers would be so fixated on Jesus, would be so transformed in their lives that the gospel would break forth from the church like never before and we would see a harvest like we've never seen before. So that's why I talk about, and the, the culture of revival, we're not unpacking what revival is. Trust me, I am not qualified to speak on that. Like, we're not going into that. We're talking about what it means to have a culture of expectancy that we want to contend to see that kind of thing happen. We want to see a visible demonstration of believers being fixated on Jesus, having their lives transformed, and the gospel going forth. Amen? Okay, awesome. That's what we're going into. And I feel the invitation from the Lord for our community is this, that like, would we model a culture that is unapologetically committed to seeing God move in this nation, to seeing revival? Would we model a culture? Would we model values? Would we model a lifestyle? Would it be the reason that we do what we do? Because we're just convinced that he is so good and that Jesus is able to move like he's moved before. So that's the invitation that we're going to unpack tonight. And... Uh, I want to say this specifically tonight. We want to talk about empowering Gen Z leaders for revival. Why? <laughs> Why empowering Gen Z leaders for revival? This is what I've come up with. <laughs> because we're a youth movement and God trusts young people with revival. God trusts young people with revival. And so I believe there is an invitation for us tonight. Don't worry if you're not in Gen Z, neither am I. We'll get onto that. But I believe there is an invitation that we would take a hold of empowering, like we talked about what it means to reach the next generation, but we would empower Gen Z leaders for revival because God trusts young people with revival. There's a, a man named Evan Roberts. He was 26 years old and he asked this question. He said, would the Lord give us 100,000 souls in Wales? And I just wonder off the back of tonight and what we're unpacking, I wonder if God would raise a generation of 26-year-olds that would pray that prayer. I wonder if God would raise a people at 26 years old that would say, would God give us 100,000 souls in their nation? Come on, because I have the fear of the Lord if those are prayers we're not praying. You know, I wonder sometimes, what if God answered every prayer that we prayed in this community? Would we see revival or have our prayers been too small? Come on, what would it look like? What are we praying? This 26-year-old uh, prays, God, would you give us 100,000 souls in Wales? And there was a girl called Flory Evans that worked with him. Flory Evans was a 19-year-old. And Evan Roberts formed a team, and she was part of that team, and they would travel across Wales preaching the gospel. And I'm just wondering, man, a 19-year-old in Wales had such a conviction of a vision for revival that she's like, I'm going to forfeit the next years of my life and commit myself to this thing. What happened? Evan Roberts, this 26-year-old, Flory Evans, and everyone else that was with them, within 12 months, they saw 100,000 people saved in Wales. Come on, God trusts young people with revival. A 26-year-old and a 16 uh, and a 19-year-old. There's a man named George Whitfield. At the age of 21, he was so on fire for the gospel and preaching the gospel that he began open-air preaching in this nation. At the age of 21, he began preaching and gathering crowds. Guys, this guy literally gathered crowds of 30,000 plus in this nation to hear the gospel. I don't know about you, but something provokes me. I'm like, man, how are we discipling 21-year-olds? Are we discipling 21-year-olds to be the most wild, fiery preachers? Like, I, I have to speak it out because my faith is not there. Like, man, a, like, a guy in his 20s would gather 30,000 people on the streets to hear the gospel. Come on, we need a culture of revival. 
as a man, uh, an American man named Lonnie Frisbee. Anyone heard of Lonnie Frisbee? Man, the, the story of the Jesus movement messed me up forever in the best way possible. Lonnie Frisbee was a 17-year-old hippie that was all in the, the drug culture, and he prayed a prayer at 17. He said, Jesus, if you're real, reveal yourself. And he had a vision, and he had a vision of lines and lines and lines of young hippies at the ocean being baptized. At 19 years old, guys, I want to hear this, 19. Put your hand if you're 19 in the room. I'm, I'm 31. I'm too old for my own sermon tonight. Literally, I'm, I'm preparing this, and I'm like, I'm done. <laughs> I've got a hand over the baton. <laughs> like, no one is as old as me in this that I'm going to talk about tonight. At 19 years old, Lonnie Frisbee becomes known for leading the Jesus movement. The Jesus movement would gather 100,000 people for rallies of young people. They would see tens of thousands of people saved in America. Guys, a few years before the Jesus movement started, the Times magazine posted a front cover article saying, is God dead because of the decline of Christianity in America? Within three or four years of the Jesus movement, the front times of the Time magazine was titled The Jesus Revolution. And this was a 19-year-old drug-induced hippie that had a vision of Jesus baptizing people. They would see tens of thousands of people saved. And guess what he saw? He saw crowds and crowds and crowds across the ocean getting baptized for Jesus. Come on. And I'm like, man, if God can use a 26-year-old and a 19-year-old to see 100,000 saved in Wales, if God can use a 19-year-old to lead a Jesus movement in America and see tens of thousands saved, what can he do with 19-year-olds in this city? What can he do with 19-year-olds in this nation? And I'm like, I, I just have the fear of the Lord. I'm worried that we're going to spend a whole life preaching down a watered gospel, and we're going to wait for people to get 30 years old, 40 years old. And I want to say, if you're in the room and you're in Gen Z, please take a hold of this radical revival culture that the gospel invites you into, because there are hundreds and hundreds of stories like this. And I just believe God is looking for the people that would believe him for his word. It sounds simple, but I'm like, man, if we believe this, it would change everything. We change everything. We change the way we disciple. So I'm going to speak to two people, two groups of people in the room tonight. Be a hand if you're in Gen Z. Okay, come on. That's good. That's a lot of people. To those that are Gen Z in the room, I believe God wants to empower Gen Z as leaders in revival. I promise this is not hype. I promise I don't just throw this out as hype. I just get convicted when I read these stories. I get convicted when I read the Bible. I get convicted at how much God uses young people. And although we may not see it yet, I feel like I have to speak this way. Like I have to believe that God wants to empower Gen Z to be a part of leading revival in this nation and the nations. Come on, because it's who he is and it's what he does. And I believe there's people in this room that it's like, as you're hearing this and as you've heard the stories in the past, something comes alive in you and you're like, I'm born for this. Like there is a life conviction that you're going to carry and that is, I am born to see revival. I am born to contend for revival. I am born not to go with the status quo of Christianity, but to believe for it, if I see it or if I never see it. Man, it, it messed me up. I read a book called God's Generals. I don't know if anyone's ever read it. I've got half of my team reading it at the moment. I read that book and it messed me up. Because I'm like, God did this through normal people. Broken people. Actually really broken people if you read the rest of their lives. But like, man, he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the other group, for those of you that are not in the Gen Z, millennials, come on, let's go. Um, I believe the invitation is this. Would we model a culture of revival? Like, would we commit that we are not here to go with the status quo, but would we actually say, God, I want to model the things that I believe? And what do I mean by that? I mean this, because what we model is what we empower other people to walk in. What we model in this community is what we empower this community to walk in. The culture that I model is the culture that I empower others to walk in. The vision that I model is the vision that I empower others to walk in. The, the rhythms and the lifestyle and the values that I model are the things that I empower others to walk in. And I believe if God wants to empower Gen Z for revival, we need to adopt a culture of revival. 
We need the fear of the Lord to say, man, the, the things that we value, prayer and worship and holiness and purity and all of these things, do we value it and do we do it just because it's the Christian thing to do? Do we do it just because it's what we do in YWAM and it's one of the 18 values? Or do we do it because we want a personal culture of revival? Like, do we do it because we actually want to disciple the people around us into a culture of revival? You with me? Is this helpful at all? Okay. Because the things we do, they're amazing. But I feel like the Lord wants to put his finger on of like the, the deeper conviction of why do I do what I do? What does it look like to commit to a culture that will empower the next generation, empower the people coming behind me to not just believe the things, but believe that God will actually do it? Okay, I felt the Lord speaking about a few things I'm going to talk about quickly. And this is in by, by no means an exhaustive list or, or what have you. I just felt, God, what are a few things tonight, specific things to, to, to kind of pinpoint? And I felt the Lord speaking about three things that would help us empower a culture of revival. And that was empowering vision, empowering faith, and empowering surrender. And I look at, at Jesus, and I look at the life that he lived with the disciples, and I'm like, man, he is the model. First of all, notice how Jesus picks young people as his disciples. Come on, because God trusts young people with revival. I don't think there was a bigger job than the disciples had. I, I like, he's crazy. If he trusted a 17-year-old and an 18-year-old with the future of Christianity, then God trusts young people with revival. Come on, if, he, if they were the people that he picked, then trust me, he's going to pick some people tonight. He's going to pick people in this generation. And I look at Jesus and I look at the disciples and I'm like, man, he empowered them with vision. Like, we're going to break it down in a minute, but he empowered them with faith. He empowered them to live lives of surrender. And he is our example. So I want to start with vision. Everyone say vision. vision. Jesus empowered the disciples with the most wild, huge vision I've ever seen. <laughs> like, I want you to think about it for a moment. Like, he didn't meet the disciples and be like, these are just a few things that you can do. Like, he casted this vision, like this extraordinary vision of the kingdom of heaven on earth. Like, I don't know about you, but that's a pretty wild vision. He casted a vision. He was like, guys, the fields are white with harvest. Go. He casted a vision like this gospel that you represent, you guys, you 17-year-olds, you 19-year-olds, you will carry this gospel to the ends of the earth. Come on, there was no limitation in the vision of Jesus. And I have the fear of the Lord that we're limiting our vision too much. Come on, because Jesus was like, I'm going to empower them with the most radical vision that, that I can give them. I was in Brazil a few years ago, and I met this guy called Joao, and he was 17 years old when he had this vision, and he said God spoke to him, and he had a vision that he was going to see revival in his home city, and he was going to see teenagers empowered for Jesus and coming to know him, and he was 18 when he was sharing this story with me, and he said, so about a year ago, I had this vision, and I started gathering young people in my parents' front room, <laughs> and we, you know, there was 10, 15 of us, and we would just pray for our nation, we'd pray for Brazil, we'd pray for revival, and then we'd go out and hit the streets. And he said within, I don't know how long it was now, four weeks, six weeks, he said, we're starting to have 25, 30, 40 people come and gather every week. And he said, we were going out and we were leading people to Jesus and they were joining. And then my friends were sharing and they would bring friends with them. And he said, it's just growing week by week. Every week there were new people that were coming. And this was a year later. He was 18 now. And he gets out his phone and he shows me a video of this group that he gathered. It was a year later and he was gathering over 500 people every week, this 18 year old. And he told me a story, he said a few weeks ago, a man came up to me with keys and he gave us a building and he said, God has given you this building because of the vision that he's given you. A building that we could have a thousand people in. 18 year old in Brazil. Come on, we need some of that Brazilian fire. Like, guys, let's not limit the vision. Let's not make the vision. Like, here, we're believing for things, but the vision's not the factory. The vision's not a new building. The vision is that God would commission a generation that we'd see revival. And trust me, he'll bring the stuff that we need along the way. Second thing, everyone say faith. <laughs> I had to think about that. <laughs> As I said that, I was like, was that the second thing? <laughs> That's some spiritual warfare in the room. Faith. Everybody say faith. faith. 
Man, Jesus empowered the disciples with faith. I'm like, I just want, like, think about Jesus as your one-on-one. -on -one. Like, we're in YWAM context. Think about him as your one-on-one. -on -one. Like, I'm sure he did some, like, good inner heart healing and stuff as well. But he literally says this. He's like, you will do the same works that I do, and even greater works than these you will do. I don't, don't know about you, but that's some, some pretty big faith. He says, whatever you bound on earth will be bound on heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed on heaven. To a bunch of teenagers. He says, you will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against you. He says, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me and you guys go therefore as my disciples. I don't know about you, but if Jesus was my one-on-one, -on -one, I'm feeling pretty full of faith. He's like, I give you authority over sickness. I give you authority over demons. Now go. And the disciples go and they see it happen. He says, I saw Satan fall like lightning. Like, come on, Jesus was radical at empowering faith in the disciples. And although revival is not a word in the Bible, I believe Jesus was just like empowering this culture of revival in them, that they'd be so full of vision for the kingdom of God, that they'd be so full of faith. And I'm just so stirred by like, man, what does it look like for a generation to take a hold of faith in that way? I want to tell you quickly about something called the student volunteer movement. Anyone heard about that? One person, two people, three people. Okay, come on. In the late, late 1800s, a movement called the Student Volunteer Movement in America became one of the greatest missionary revival, sending people to the nation's thing that ever existed. And it was full of students. It was wild. At a conference, 100 university students heard the call of missions and heard about the nations. And they signed a missionary declaration that they would go to the nations. That's how it was birthed. Their bold faith was this. This was the motto of the movement, that we would see the evangelization of the world in our generation. Come on, talk about a faith statement. That we would see the evangelization of the world in our generation. Guys, our, our vision's too small. Our faith is too small. These guys were wild. Over the following year, an additional 2,100 students signed up to go to another nation to share the gospel. One of the stories was a guy called Samuel, awesome name, who became known as the Apostle to Islam. He was a student in Michigan when he signed up, and he ended up ministering to Muslims for the next 39 years. The student volunteer movement continued for the next 40 years, where they sent over 20,000 students to foreign nations. And I was reading about this earlier in the week, uh, week, and I was getting so moved as I was reading stories of normal students that gave up their careers, that gave up their plans, that gave up their studies, that heard this call, that went and committed the next 39 years to Muslims in another nation. And this was their bold faith declaration that we would see the evangelization of the world in our generation. Come on, what would it look like to take a hold of radical faith? And I feel, feel the Lord asking us, like, is your vision full of faith for you personally? You're going on outreach. Like, are you just praying enough for a good outreach or are you praying for a nation to be changed? Like, are we sending, like, I'm concerned if no DTS students ever come back from outreach and, and, and don't move to the nation. Like, are we praying just for the, the two months we're going to be there? Or are, we, are we praying with surrendered hearts that God would give us a heart for the nation that we'd never leave? I'm probably breaking every rule, so I did to your staff. Come back for your graduation. <laughs> like, man, is, is our skepticism killing our faith? Is our bad experience killing our faith? Or can we say that we are full of faith? Okay, third thing. Surrender. Everyone say surrender. surrender. And actually, I'll call up the, the worship band if you guys want to come up, because this will be the last one, and we'll end on this. Surrender. Again, we see Jesus with the disciples. He didn't just meet them and, and, and tell them, you know, you can think about doing this. Why didn't you try this? Like he invited them to radical surrender from when he first met them. He said, give up everything and follow me. This was part of the call. Jesus didn't just say it. He modeled it. He's, he sat in the garden. And he said, Father, let this cup pass me by. But if it's your will... Come on, he modeled what it looked like to be surrendered to the will of God. 
His very call to be his disciple was to deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow me. I believe Jesus wants to empower us into radical surrender. Like what would it look like to truly live surrendered lives? Man, like these guys in the student volunteer movement, like these other people that we've talked about, that our lives would be surrendered, that God, I'm not alive for me. I'm not here for my own future and my own success and my own growth and all of these things. God, I'm a surrendered life for what you want to do, God for your gospel to go forth. There's like no one greater I think of when it comes to movements, when I think about radical surrender than the Moravians movement. Has anyone heard of the Moravians movement? I used to live in Hernhut where the Moravians lived and they had 24 seven prayer. I should know for how many years, but I can't remember right now. 250 years or something wild, 24 seven prayer. And they would send out missionaries to the nations. I'm gonna share a very famous story some of you have heard but it's often shared wrongly, so I'm going to share the correct version. <laughs> Two of the first missionaries that, that left from the Moravians overseas is because they heard about slaves in the West Indies that were growing up and going their entire life without hearing the gospel. And there were these two missionaries in their early 20s. Everyone say early 20s two missionaries in their early 20s that heard this, that had such a surrendered life that they said, maybe it is worth us going and selling ourselves into slavery that they might get the gospel. That's radical. If you think we're radical, we're not radical. (laughs) We need to be more radical. And so these guys, it wasn't just a moment. They went. They went with the full intent to sell themselves into slavery to bring the gospel. That's normally where the story ends, like them sailing off on the ship, like what happened. The reality is they didn't sell themselves into slavery. They didn't need to. And there was, but they went with that expectation. And there's a book called The History of the Moravian Church that says this. It says, as they stepped ashore the next day, they opened a new chapter in the history of modern Christianity. They were the founders of the work among the slaves. For the next 50 years, Moravian missionaries labored in the West Indies without any support from any other religious denomination. They established churches across St. Thomas, Jamaica, Antigua, and Barbados. They had 13,000 baptized converts before a missionary from any other church arrived on the scene. Guys, two radical missionaries in their 20s heard a call about slaves that would never hear the gospel and said we would go with the full intent to sell themselves into slavery. And as a result, 13,000 baptized converts before any other missionary arrived on the scene. Talk about a surrendered life. Man, I want to suggest that these missionaries were not going through the status quo of Christianity. I want to suggest that these these missionaries captured something of the heart of God. I want to suggest that these missionaries had a revival culture that was too much for them to just stay in a building. Like, I don't know what compels you to sell yourself into slavery, but they must have had a revival culture, and I believe we need the same. Is anyone with me? Come on, that God would give us just a, a burden and a commitment that we would live not the status quo, but we would adopt a revival culture. That we would say, God, I'm not here to just go through the motions of Christianity. I don't just come and worship on a Monday morning because it's the thing we do. God, I'm here because I have the fear of the Lord that I need to be developed and molded and shaped into a revival culture. I have the fear of the Lord because when I read these stories and I read about people like Evan Roberts and and other amazing people, their lives ended up becoming pretty broken. And I have the fear of the Lord. I'm like, man, maybe there's people in here that in five years' time are going to be a part of leading revival. And how are we discipling them now? Come on, how are we grounding people in the presence of God, not because it's a rhythm, but because they absolutely need it to sustain what they're going to do in their life? And I just believe that that there are people in this room, I said at the beginning, that God wants to mark you for revival. I believe there's people in the room where it's like God wants to mark the conviction on your life that this is the reason that I'm alive. And I believe it starts tonight. So I want to do an invitation. This is not a general invitation for us all to respond to. If that is you, 
If you're like, God, I want to be alive to see revival. I want to be a part of the big things you're doing. I want to be empowered in my faith, in my vision, and my surrender to not go through the status quo, but I want to be a part of revival in this nation and the nations. Then I want to invite you to stand.